but uh, Kenya is known for a lot of things, but in the community, but like one particular thing is to bring the community of cryptographers and the pipe cryptographers, which you would think should be kind of communicate with each other, but I think until maybe whatever, 10 years ago, these were really kind of two separate, separate communities, to bring in those communities to, together. For example, he's the founder together with Nigel Smart of the uh, real world cryptography continents, which you know, was started a few years ago, and by now it's actually bigger than the actual crypto conference. So it's, you know, there are a few fields, I think, in science where you can make a, a conference that is called New World X in the field X, and people not being upset because I think people realized that this was kind of necessary. And I think today, Kenny will not only talk about the pipe cryptography, but even a step further, like deployed cryptography, like the pipe cryptography in the wild. Uh, I guess about the line of research that was kind of exceptionally successful in the last year. So we got all the best paper awards at the main SP and CCS and you know all the top security conferences, at least if the crypto ones were for the other stuff. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I'm really looking forward to this talk on about the topic in the wild. Thank, Thank you. Thanks. Thanks everyone for coming. Um, I hope you can hear me okay on the on the Zoom. I've been told I should stand somewhere like in view of the camera. So I try to do both audiences at the same time. Um, thank you all for the organization and uh, thanks uh, everybody at this for the invitation to come and speak. I don't do too many public talks at the moment because I also am the head of the department of computer science at ETH, which means uh, I have to herd around 40 something professors and 600 scientific staff and it's like a full time job. So it's actually very nice to come and give a talk and talk about research instead of talk about you know, hiring processes or something with the with my shoe light. So this is actually a real pleasure for me to be here. Um, so let me give you a quick overview of what I want to cover today. I'm going to talk about the spread of cryptography in the wild. Uh, I'm going to talk about what is cryptography in the wild, what's our program, what are we trying to achieve, uh, how we do it. And I'll talk about, if there's time, two case studies, uh, Threema and Mega. So Threema is a, a messaging protocol, secure messaging protocol, think WhatsApp or Signal. And Mega is a secure cloud storage system. And maybe there's only time to do one of the two. Maybe we can have a vote and see uh, which one you prefer to learn about. I'll talk about some of the challenges of doing this kind of work, why it's difficult, why you might want to join and, and do more of this, and why you might not want to start down this, uh, down this path. Actually, I've been talking to quite a few of you uh, in, in meetings with small groups and one-to-ones today, and I've discovered that many of, you, many of you are already doing this kind of work in your own specific domain. So a lot of what I'm going to tell you, uh, you already know in the context of, say, web security uh, or cryptocurrencies or some other aspects. So I hope I'm not telling you, I'll, I'll try not to bore you with things that you already know about, uh, and then we'll wrap up. So that's the plan. Let's first of all talk about the spread of cryptography in the wild. So once upon a time, we had uh, Caesar cipher, and that was the only cryptography there was, more or less. Uh, then over time, cryptography became something that we, we began to be used by governments, by militaries. Eventually, it made its way into the financial system. You know, why do we need cryptography? Well, it's because we want to protect money. Uh, and in those days, uh, old forms of money, but today, new forms of money. And we've reached the point where actually cryptography is used in many, 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 many different places. Here's a list of places I made uh, last night and eventually when I was making the slides and eventually I ran out of uh, places where cryptography is used, but probably you can think of things to add to this list, right? So often uh, when about five years ago, I would do um, talks to, uh, you know, to public lectures to not people who are working in cryptography and security, but just a general audience. And I would ask them, who here has ever used cryptography? And most of them would say, no, I've never used cryptography. And then you say, well, do you have a mobile phone? You know, every time you make a phone call, your voice is encrypted and so on. So you're using cryptography. Do you have a bank card? You're using cryptography. Do you use social media? You're using cryptography. And um, so, you know, nowadays it's more than just secure communications. We're using cryptography all over the place. Uh, and this is very nice. This makes cryptography extremely relevant. Um, and uh, it means that we can write lots of cool grant applications and get lots of money to fund our research. So we like the fact that cryptography is used uh, in the wild in lots of different places. Here's just one chart that sort of illustrates some of the growth in cryptography. This is the use of encryption across Google uh, between 2014 and 2021. Uh, and what you see is that at some point in the past, about 50% of Google internal services were encrypted. 
And nowadays, it's more, it's, you know, it's above 90%. Uh, the, the line has become almost flat. So everything that could be encrypted is now encrypted, let's say, uh, across Google. Um, maybe maybe they've gone as far as they can in deploying cryptography or deploying encryption specifically for their, for their network traffic. Um, an interesting thing happened uh, around 2013, about a year before this chart started. Um, and that was the Snowden revelations where we find out that uh, the US government and other governments were basically attempting to do mass surveillance uh, on all of our internet traffic. And there was a famous uh, slide in the Snowden revelations that showed uh, Google to Google services, but the encryption was terminated at something called the GFE, the Google front end, and the plain text was then available there. And this really pissed off Google. Uh, and you know, they then actually, you know, at a very high level in the company, uh, decided to start encrypting as much of their traffic as they could. So the growth in this curve is a direct response to the Snowden revelations in 2013. So that just gives you a flavor. Um, so what is crypto in the wild? What do I mean when I talk about cryptography in the wild? And how does it differ from applied cryptography? So Christoph already hinted at the difference between these two things uh, in his introduction. So what, what we mean by crypto in the wild is not developing new crypto that might be applied, but finding interesting examples of crypto that's already been used. By the way, when I say crypto, I mean cryptography, okay? just, just to be clear. So cryptography is being used in standards, in products, in deploying systems. Okay, so find examples of it. What do I mean by interesting? Well, we'll talk about what interesting means later, but here I'm not talking about nowadays, somebody is using TLS to encrypt data between a mobile app and a server. Okay, that's now done, standard, boring. Sure, there's issues around certificate management, but the basic crypto is excellent, nothing to worry about there. Here, we're talking about more exotic forms of cryptography, maybe uh, people rolling their own protocols to do secure communication or people building cloud storage systems, for example. Then we analyze these things. <clears throat> and what we try to do is find vulnerabilities and then go through a responsible disclosure process or a coordinated vulnerability disclosure process and get them fixed. Or, and at the same time, depending on what we find, uh, we might build security models for that deployed cryptography and then develop proofs in those security models and try to give some kind of security assurances for that deployed cryptography. And actually, as part of this, Sometimes we find out that practice is, is ahead of theory, and it turns out that some organization or company or group of engineers has encountered a cryptographic problem for which there does not already exist a solution in the literature, or not one that they can easily adapt to their particular problem, and they invent something new. And usually they invent something that works, but might not be the best possible security you can achieve. So there are often instances where we get to identify new cryptographic research problems by looking what about what by looking at what's happening in the wild. Okay, so there's this feedback from the wild back into the research lab. So we capture these wild instances and we tame them and we you know do formal security analysis on them. Um, at the same time, we want to do the standard academic things. We want to write research papers. We also want to build relationships with vendors so that the next time we find a vulnerability in our code, we have we know the right people to talk to to get it fixed. We want to train students. And in general, what we want to do is improve the quality of deployed cryptography. Why do we want to improve the quality of deployed cryptography? Why do we care? Well, fundamentally, it's because we care about users who are using these kinds of systems these days to run their lives, to protect their most secret, most private information. And actually, my feeling is that I have a moral responsibility to do the best I can to protect those users from the software companies and the tech companies that are giving them crap cryptography, right? So try to make their cryptography better uh, because of the deficiencies that we find in deployed systems. Good, so that's the what. Um, where does the term come from? Or crypto in the wild? I mean, star in the wild is kind of a standard term, but I was trying to track down where exactly um, this term popped up from. And I remembered having a conversation with Martin. Martin Albrecht is one of my kind of long-term collaborators. We've written a lot of, a lot of these research papers that I'm gonna talk about are written in collaboration with Martin and his students and my students. So I, I sent him a signal message. So we use cryptography to communicate. Uh, and I said, I'm giving this talk tomorrow in Vienna about crypto in the wild. What's the origin of the phrase? 
I seem to recall that you came up with it when we were first formulating joint supervision of master students at EPH. So we did this thing where I, I, would, I had access to great students, he had great ideas, and I just joined them together and let them do stuff, and then I could just step back and put my name on the papers, right? So that's a great model of operation. Uh, and this is maybe it goes back further. And Martin said, I thought it was your phrase. And I was like, wow, okay. So then I did some Google searches and I came up with this talk by Nick Sullivan. So Nick is with uh, Cloudflare, which is this you know, huge, uh, uh, what are they? I guess they're a, a website posting company and also they provide like denial of service protection and so on. And Nick is now the head of research at Cloudflare. At this time, he was the head of cryptography research at Cloudflare. And he gave a talk way back in 2019 called Cryptography in the Wild. So I guess he has some kind of claim to ownership of this phrase. But I actually went back slightly further and I found uh, the PhD thesis of Igor Stepanovs, who was a PhD student at UCSB under Mahir Balari. And his thesis title was Theoretical Foundations of Cryptography in the Wild. So Igor was, was, uh, was ahead of everybody, I think. And this is also in 2019, but clearly uh, he was thinking about this uh, before uh, before Nick and before us. So uh, props to Igor's for coming up with the term crypto in the wild. Okay, so just to give you a flavor, what do I mean by this? What are we been looking at uh, specifically in my research with our collaborators? And here I've done, done this kind of the cryptographic triangle. I don't know if you've seen this before, but it, it captures the essence of different types of cryptographic application. So at the top, we have secure communications. Here you can think TLS or messaging protocols. Bottom left, we have data at rest, so secure storage. And on the right-hand side, we have data under computation. And this, this actually is a huge bucket that includes things like FHE and MPC and all kinds of other funky advanced cryptography. So the stuff on the left-hand side and the top side is kind of boring, standard, normal cryptography. And then the stuff on the right-hand side is where you know, a lot of the excitement is these days. You might ask, where on this chart does cryptocurrencies sit? I don't really know. Uh, I think it's something like, it's a mixture of data at rest and data in transit, I guess. Uh, because like, you know, data at rest, you're securing, you're storing data in the blockchain, let's say. And data in transit, well, there's a communication network, there's like, uh, anyway. Uh, and here, the pink color encodes uh, work that was done that really started as master's students projects at ETH. And one of the big takeaways I think I, I want to leave you with from this whole talk is that these kinds of research projects are a great way of involving master's students and getting them excited about cryptography and converting them into PhD students who work in the area of cryptography. So a lot of these projects started that way uh, with, with, with master's students uh, in, my, in my research group. So on the top left-hand side, data in transit, we had a whole bunch of projects over the last, these are all from the last two years, actually. Uh, so we looked at Telegram, we looked at a bunch of different things. Uh, we looked at Telegram twice, actually. Uh, and a little bit later, I'll talk about, I'll talk about three months. So that started as a master's thesis project uh, with a master's student called Kien, Kien Tuan Pro. And, uh, and, and now he has actually, he's one of these examples of someone who stayed with us and came through and has become a PhD student in my group. So we're doing a lot of interesting work together now. Um, and then the data at rest uh, on that side, uh, the first paper that we wrote on Mega that appeared at uh, Oakland this year uh, was with a, a master's student, Miro Haller, and Miro is now a PhD student at UCSD. Uh, also our, our project on Nextcloud that I won't talk about today. Uh, and then data under computation. Most recently here, uh, this, this paper was only released earlier in June. Uh, we, we analyzed MongoDB variable encryption. So MongoDB, you know, is a big database provider and they launched a kind of searchable encryption uh, system uh, last year, in the middle of last year. And, and we analyzed that and wrote a paper about it. So uh, more information about that on my, on my group's web page. And finally, we also have looked at some uh, cryptocurrency stuff. So uh, we had a paper at Usenix Security back in 2020, but also this year, a Usenix Security paper uh, where we look at Ethereum proof of work and we break the synchronization mechanism uh, that's used in Ethereum proof of work. And I can tell you more about that afterwards if you like. I, I don't have slides on it here today. Uh, but you know, the long and short is that they used some bad crypto and we were able to exploit that to find attacks against the system. So those are some examples of what I mean by crypto in the wild projects. Let's, let's dig in a little bit now and talk about the how. How do we, now we know what the what is, how do we do this? 
Well, the first step is to figure out what you're going to analyze, what crypto in the wild is interesting. And so you need some criteria to make your selection of targets. And here's a partial list of things that we use when we're thinking about what we want to look at. So um, we want to find things that are using cryptography in interesting ways. So as I mentioned these days, if you find a system that's using TLS to protect client-server communications, unless they do something funky, novel, original, you should move on, right? You should leave it alone and go and do something else. Because these days, TLS implementations, for the most part, are pretty secure. Uh, we understand what the right cyber suites are these days. So there's, there's really nothing, nothing to see here if somebody's just using TLS. So we want to find something non-trivial, non-standard, something interesting that, uh, that people have come up with. Um, an important consideration is the size of the user base. And here you're starting to think about what would the impact be if we were able to analyze the system and find attacks or develop a security proof and give, give better assurance, right? What would, so for example, Telegram is interesting, was interesting for us because they have something like 700 million users. So anything you can say about a system at that scale, there's, uh, you know, it has value simply because of the scale of the system, right? If you can provide an assurance or eliminate security weaknesses, then you're definitely helping users by improving the security of the systems that they use. Um, local importance. So here, Threema is an example. So Threema is a Swiss messaging app used only by about 10 million people. So a tiny fraction of the user base of Telegram. But every time I gave a talk on Telegram, somebody in the Swiss audience would ask me, but what about Threema? Is it secure? And I would have to say, I don't know, I haven't looked at it. After being asked three times, I said, okay, I will look at it. And then we looked at it. And uh, at the same time as we were looking at it, it became mandated for use in the Swiss military. So the Swiss government decided that every Swiss soldier should use Prima for all of their secure communications, okay? And actually that's half of the Swiss population because every young man in Switzerland has to join the army at some point and do military service. Right, so this is this makes it a very interesting and let's say more important target in a local context than, than otherwise it would be. Um, availability of source code. It helps if, you, if, if you're trying to attract students to come and work with you, that you don't ask them as a first task to reverse engineer some horrible obfuscated JavaScript. Okay, better to that they can start with some nice clean source code uh, and not have to do reverse engineering. You might also worry about the legality of reverse engineering. And you know, in different countries, it's more or less legal to do this. Maybe it's okay for research purposes, not for commercial purposes. Who knows? It depends on your local legal framework. Ask your local lawyer. Actually, it's the very last thing you should do in a university context, right? Never ask the lawyers in your university advice on anything. Just do it and then ask forgiveness afterwards. It's some advice I would give you. Okay. I'm saying that purely in my role as a professor uh, at ETH, not as the head of the department. Absolutely. But I'm not anybody's boss there. Uh, you know, the professors all report to the president, so it's there. They're on their own. Um, then another important thing is whether you can find some kind of white paper that describes the crypto that they're using. This is actually pretty common for things like secure messengers or cloud storage systems. So I'm trying to think, I think Mega had a pretty good white paper that described what they were doing. It will, it will not be 100% accurate, but it will give you a starting point to understand how their system works, right? You mustn't believe what you read in white papers, but you can at least use it to inform your thinking, okay? And then very interestingly, a lot of vendors make extreme security claims. They claim things like, we do zero knowledge encryption. I have no idea what that means, but it tells me that they don't know much about cryptography and therefore it makes it a more interesting part of it, okay? So whenever you see military grade encryption, zero knowledge encryption, those kinds of phrases that are like not standard, uh, you know that this is possibly something worth looking at. You might find something there if you're thinking about attacks in particular. Um, so uh, that can be a useful starting point. And then finally, the final criterion I use is my sense of smell. Does it smell right? Or does it smell bad? And uh, I cannot really define that for you further, but it's a sense that you will develop over time if you get into this game, right? Does it, does it pass the sniff test or not? Okay, so that's a little bit of a less uh, 
concrete criterion to use, but still it's something you can you can use. Okay, so now you've 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 tar you've selected your target using these criteria. You found some big app with a huge user base using interest in cryptography. What do you do next? Well, we have two modes of operation depending on whether you're in attack mode or in proof mode. Okay, and I'll say a little bit more in a moment about how do you know which mode to go for. If you're in attack mode, this is what you do, this is what we do. Uh, define the target and the objectives for your research, like what kinds of attacks are you trying to find? What, what elements of the system are you trying to analyze? Because it could be a very large system with many different components using cryptography. Maybe you want to focus a little bit. Um, okay, then you might uh, develop relevant threat models. So if you're attacking a cloud storage system, does the vendor claim that they offer end-to-end -end encryption security? If they do, then it makes sense to think of the service provider themselves as being malicious, because what they're claiming is that users are protected against them as a service provider for confidentiality and integrity. Okay, so then uh, the threat model can be stronger depending on what the security claims by made by the vendor are, and what you try to prove then could also be stronger or weaker accordingly. Uh, so it's not fair to break something in a threat model that's like purely, uh, you know, academic, unrealistic, right? That doesn't relate to the claims made by the vendor. Um, then you would read the white paper and read the code and try to figure out what's going on. You would then do the following. Uh, you would then build pseudocode models of the cryptographic core. So you would identify the parts of the system that are cryptographically relevant, and you would write them down as pseudocode in a kind of high level mathematical style language. And the reason to do this is because this is the only thing I want to see as the professor involved in this project, right? I mean, because I don't want, personally, sorry, I don't want to read code. I will if you force me to, if you really want my input on code, I'll read the code. But in general, what I would like is more like a mathematical abstraction of what the cryptography is. And that's the point where I can you know, start to help maybe students to analyze a system using the experience that, that I have or, or you know, some other uh, professor might have in terms of finding attacks or, bu or building proofs. This is here right now, we're in attack mode. So the next step is to write down attack ideas. Obviously, going from the first bullet point to the second bullet point is non-trivial, right? This requires you to stare for a long time until an attack comes into your head. Okay, that's how we find attacks, right? We think. I'm, I'm only partially joking when I say that, okay? How do you find attacks against systems? What do you do? Well, you play around with it, you try things, you try to understand what's going on, you, you remember some other paper that you read that had some idea in it, maybe you can apply it here and so on and so on, okay? So this is not an exact science, um, but partly the reason I'm listing, well, but let me finish the process first, then I'll explain why I'm listing it like this. So write down attack ideas on paper. And then if you're in attack mode, it's not enough to have an attack on paper. You should also try to build a proof of concept for, the, for each of the attacks that you find and figure out whether the attack really works or not. And the reason to do this is that there can be a big gap between a, a, an attack that works on paper and an attack that works in reality because the actual running code can have a lot of you know, complex functions that you don't understand. Something get, can get in the way of your attack from working. So you really need to do this if you're serious about being in attack mode. And then you do this until enough attacks have been found. Okay, and then you write a research paper and you start the disclosure process with the affected organization or organizations if it's like a standard and there's many different implementations on it. This is a process. Why, why do I write this like this? Well, this is a response to reviewers who demand to understand the methodology for this kind of research, right? So you can take a photo of this slide and next time referee B or two says, but you've written this attack paper, but you must explain your methodology. You can just cut and put paste this thing. So, okay, this is, this is the Patterson methodology, if you like, right? That you're all following them, okay? And then they will accept your paper. So that's attack mode. Uh, proof mode is similar but different. So in proof mode, the first few steps are the same. Um, then there's a do loop where you build pseudocode models again. And now you develop suitable security models and you write security proofs. And again, there's a lot of complexity hidden here. What do I mean by a suitable security model? How do you know that your model is broad enough? 
that it's rich enough that it captures the actual adversarial capabilities. Maybe the proof is non-trivial. Writing security proofs might involve, I don't know, in our Telegram paper, I think we had one proof that has like 13 or 14 game halts, for example. So like this might be a non-trivial task that takes a lot of time and a lot of effort. Then you do this until enough proofs have been produced, until you prove everything that you think it's necessary to prove, and then you write a research paper. So the core difference here is that this time you only write a research paper, you don't do a disclosure. journal. That sounds like a trivial difference, but actually in practice, it's an enormous difference because as many of you know, running a disclosure process with some set of vendors who might not even be that security aware can be very time consuming and very stressful, especially if you're also trying to publish a paper at the same time, right? You're trying to run these things in parallel. So those are the two modes. Um, actually though, in practice, these two modes can exist in superposition. At the beginning of the research, you don't know if you're going to find proofs or you're going to find attacks. So you do both things at the same time until you get convinced one way or the other, then you observe the quantum state and it collapses to attack mode or proof mode, one or the other. And that's the way that you go. Okay. Actually, that's not quite true. You can publish quantum attack papers where in the paper itself, you have a superposition of the two modes, right? So this is an example. This is our, our first paper on Telegram with Martin, with Lenka Marakova and with Igor's, uh, where we had both attacks and a proof of security for Telegram. How is this possible? How can you break it and prove it secure? Well, of course we broke it. Then we explained how to fix it. And then we proved that the fixes were sound in some suitable computation and security model. And this was published uh, last year at Oakland. Um, so this is an example where the superposition persists all the way up until the end of the publication process. Good. Okay. So um, here's a few things. If you're if you're attack minded, here's a few things that I look for when analyzing these kinds of systems. So this is kind of what's in my toolbox, if you like, the kind of things I like to try to do against these systems. I actually missed some of the list now. It just popped into my head some of the ones I missed. But anyway, you might look for things like the use of ECD mode. Remember the Linux penguin being encrypted, but you can still see the penguin. How many of you have seen that cartoon? A few of you, okay. If you haven't seen it, go Google after the talk for ECB Linux penguin, and it will blow your mind if you've never seen it before. Okay, it shows you that encryption in these kinds of modes isn't very good. You might look for other kinds of modes, exotic modes or homemade encryption modes. A good example here, Telegram was using a mode called IGE. How many of you have heard of IGE? Fantastic. That's what, actually the response I wanted, right? That proves that it's an exotic mode of operation. Log cipher. IGE stands for Infinite Garble Extension. And it was invented in the 80s and never made it into any standards. But Telegram decided they should use it because it's better than CBC when it comes to error propagation in the plain text when you flip bits in the cipher text. They thought. Okay. Um, you might also look for a lack of integrity mechanisms. So you might look for something like counter mode on its own with no max. That means you can do bit flipping, you can make control changes in the plain text, for example. You might look for improper use of integrity. So you might look for combinations where the MAC is applied before the encryption or the MAC is, in, is applied uh, in parallel with the encryption. So MTE, uh, TLS 1.0, E and M, SSH, uh, and also Telegram, actually. And the attacks that we found on SSH back in 2009, 2010, I think it was an Oakland 2010 paper, almost exactly apply to Telegram in, in our 2023 paper. So a whole decade went past and the same attack vector still works against a different system because it was encrypted and Mac. There's like a tiny side channel because of that. You might look for padding Oracle attacks. Classic one is to look for nonce reuse. So you know that nonce means number used once, right? Nonce-based encryption. Uh, think of AES PCM with 96-bit nonces. You should never reuse the same nonce with the same key. Otherwise, all integrity is lost and also confidentiality can be broken. Next cloud, right? Which is like the second largest by market share end-to-end -end encryption for cloud service provider with huge customers, massive in Germany, lots and lots of corporate customers had two, two separate non-reuse vulnerabilities in their code, which meant that whenever a file was modified and then re-encrypted and re-uploaded to the cloud, the same nonce could be used under ASPC. 
which means as an attacker, you could recover the plain text, okay? Uh, depending on exactly what edits were done to the file in between. And this is like a very, very basic thing to look for. And no code should be vulnerable to nonce reuse in the year 2023. But you will find this. You'll find it everywhere. Um, another good thing to look for is a lack of proper key separation or key reuse problems. So reusing the same cryptographic keys in different functions. Threema had this in uh, two different places and gave us two different attacks against Threema. I'll maybe explain one of them in a little while. You can find bad interactions between different protocols. You can find bespoke RSA padding schemes. So, you know, we can't just use RSA. We can't just write C equals N to the E mod N. I mean, you can if you're doing textbook RSA and people will do that in real cryptographic deployments. They should be using something like RSA PTCS number one version 2.1, RSA OAP, okay? That would be the right thing to use. But lots of developers will invent their own RSA padding scheme. And then they'll be vulnerable to some variant of Lycan Packer's attack, you bet. So in the first mega paper, we found a new novel variant of the Black and Backer attack against RSA that was enabled by their use of a bespoke padding scheme. Um, you will find everywhere people rolling their own, making their own authentication and key exchange protocols. So they'll use something like um, Curve 25519 Diffie Hellman key exchange, which is a very good choice. Uh, but then they will forget that they need forward security or they will. Uh, create a protocol which is vulnerable to replay attacks or something. And I'll show you an example of that with Threema in a few slides time. So you'll find this everywhere. And this somehow reflects the lack of widely available good standards for things like authentication and key exchange, right? This is where you start to go away from low level cryptographic algorithms and you start to build more complex interactive protocols and then things will go wrong. You'll find lots of na naive use of good crypto libraries. So NACLO is a pretty good crypto library. Uh, but it has a limited interface and then developers will do things to try to get around the interface to do what they want to do. And in doing that, they will, they will end up with insecure cryptography. This is another mistake that Threema made actually. Okay, use of weak pseudorandom number generators or homebrew randomness generation methods. This is uh, everywhere. Mostly you would think weak PRNGs would have gone by now. Most operating system supplied PRNGs are, are pretty good by now but people will still invent their own phone. So for example, Ethereum proof of work synchronization mechanism was using a PRNG, which only had 31 bits of state. So there were two to the 31 possible output sequences. That sounds like a lot, but actually you can enumerate two to the 31 output sequences pretty quickly and then figure out like what the future outputs will be and use that to break Ethereum synchronization, for example. Okay, another classic is you see compression combined with encryption. So you want to compress your data and then encrypt it. Now the problem is the amount of compression you get depends on the plain text that you have. And you can turn that into a plain text recovery attack in certain situations. So uh, some of you might have heard of the crime attack against TLS from back in 2012. That's a classic example. Threema also suffered, suffered from a crime-like compression attack against its backup mechanism where the attacker, by sending a message to a user, could get their chosen plain text inserted into the user's list of, of uh, contacts and nicknames that were stored in the, uh, in the file that was going to be backed up. So now, you, so now when the file got backed up, the amount of compression you got depended on the nickname. But you could choose the nickname to match bytes of the private key, because the private key was also included in the backup. So if you happen to match a byte of the private key, you would get slightly more compression than you would otherwise. And if you do this in the right way, by doing many, many, many backups with carefully chosen nicknames, you, you could recover uh, the user's long-term private key in the account. So you can read about that in our, in our, um, in our Threema paper, uh, which is uh, available online. So this is a fatal uh, combination. You have, it's very, very easy to get this wrong. Okay, good, and dot, dot, dot. These are the ones I thought about, but there are, there are many others. There's things like uh, encrypting large files chunk by chunk, but forgetting to put in any information that forces the chunks to be recorded or replayed in the right order, so the chunks can be reordered. If you allow that kind of attack, you can sometimes achieve uh, uh, arbitrary code execution, for example, okay? depending on how you can reorder chunks. 
you can use chunks to build execution gadgets essentially by, by reordering blocks. So there's lots of other things here that you could add, but this is like, I don't know, this is like the top 13 things I would look for when first assessing a system for a test. Okay, um, so let's do one or two case studies. Uh, I will get pulled off stage at some point or you will get up and leave uh, when you've had enough. I'll focus on Threema and then we'll see how the time looks and maybe we'll look at Mega as well. So um, this is just to show a little bit of the, of the process and some of the mistakes that developers make. So Threema, what is Threema? Um, they have a logo, very nice logo. Um, it's an end-to-end -end encrypted instant messaging application released in 2012. And until late 2022, 2023, the cryptography used in Threema had not really changed very much since 2012. So at the time back in 2012, this was before WhatsApp was entered and encrypted, is prior to the existence of Signal and the double ratchet. So it's kind of um, pretty old school, right? It's a pretty ancient piece of software in terms of its crypto design. And one of the things that we'll see is that somehow the design was kind of trapped in this uh, 10 year old uh, kind of style of thinking about what security should a secure messenger be. Um, here's something from their website. Uh, Threema is 100% Swiss made, hosts its own servers in Switzerland and unlike US services, it's fully GDPR compliant. And this I find very interesting. Um, Switzerland and Swiss is mentioned twice here. And there's this idea that because it's Swiss, it must be secure. Because, you know, we have lots of gold in our bank vaults. Uh, yeah, I mean, how many of you have heard of Crypto AG and the Crypto AG scandal, right? Some of you have, right? So this was a Swiss company uh, that was selling cryptographic equipment to more than 100 countries around the world. And it turned out that this company, all of its products were backdoored. Well, no, no, all of the exported products were backdoored. And the company was actually a fully owned entity owned by the CIA and the German BND through, through a sequence of shell companies. Okay, so Swiss, Switzerland security, uh, yeah. I'm not sure it means so much, but still companies are using this as a way of promoting, uh, promoting themselves. Uh, what else can we say about Threema? Well, it has 11 million private users worldwide, so that's pretty tiny. Um, but importantly, it has some very important corporate customers, including the Swiss government, Mercedes-Benz. I don't know if you recognize, recognize this guy. Olaf Scholz uses uh, Threema. So there was actually a news story with, uh, in which Olaf Scholz was holding his mobile phone, which I guess he calls a handy. And you could see the Threema logo on the screen. Okay, and then Threema used this as marketing for Threema to say, look, even Olaf Scholz is using this, this app. Okay, so for us, it became important because people kept asking me about it after, uh, after our telegram work and because of the requirement by the Swiss government that the Swiss, Swiss military should, should use Threema. So let, there's a question. No. Let's talk a little bit about threat models for Threema. So we, came up with three distinct threat models that we wanted to explore. The first one on the left here is the strongest one where the attacker has direct access to your mobile device. And maybe the only thing protecting the security of your messages now is a pin that you've set on the app. Okay, so you might have pin access for the app. Um, the external actor is like the traditional network adversary who's located on the network somewhere between the mobile device and the server and is trying to, you know, learn the content of messages. So this is the weakest attacker really in this picture. And then because it's meant to be an end-to-end -end encrypted messenger, it makes sense to say, well, what if Threema have been compromised? What if Threema is malicious or Threema has been compromised by a malicious party? What can a party sitting on the server do to undermine the end-to-end -end security guarantees of protocol? Here's a high level view of the, of the, of the Threema system. Here, there are other components, like there's a registration component and there's a backup component, which we, which we also analyzed, but I don't have them. I'm not gonna talk about them today. So there's two protocols. Um, Alice talks to the server using a client server protocol, and so does Bob. So this is for like, they, 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 they log in, and then they're able to download messages from the server. Uh, but the messages themselves are end-to-end -end encrypted between Alice and Bob um, using long-term key pairs. So Alice will generate a long-term term key pair, SKA, PKA, and so will Bob. 
And these are actually these are actually curve two five five one nine elliptic curve Diffie Hellman P pairs. So SKA is just like some X, and PKA is a point X times P on an elliptic curve if you know about ECC. Okay, and Bob has a similar pair. So there's these two layers of encryption which are running simultaneously. So Alice will tend to have like a long-term login with the with the Threema server for sending and receiving lots of messages, and then the Messages are protected. The messages themselves are protected in an end-to-end -end manner using the, using the shared key between Alice and Bob. So here is the end-to-end -end encryption protocol. It's very simple. From Alice's long-term secret key and Bob's long-term public key, we can make a key, a symmetric key, K. Um, and you can do Bob can do the same thing using his private key and and uh, Alice's public key. Here we trust the server to distribute the public keys correctly. So this gives them a symmetric key, and then they use that key, that symmetric key, in uh, authenticated encryption scheme. Uh, it's actually, I think, it's based on ChaCha Twenty Poly Thirteen Hundred Five, if I recall correctly. So that's a non-spaced encryption scheme, um, and they use that to exchange their messages. So the problem with this is that it has no forward secrecy. The same key is used forever between Alice and Bob. In the end-to-end -end protocol, so that means if I break into uh, Alice's mobile phone and I'm able to extract her secret key, her long-term secret key, and I've recorded the traffic, maybe I'm the server, I'm now able to read all of the messages for all previous time periods that Alice and Bob have exchanged. The key doesn't evolve in any way, right? So, are some of you familiar with Signal Double Ratchet, for example? Yeah, a few of you are. Okay, so there, what happens is if you don't know every message you send. Essentially, you get a new key, which is which is obtained by either doing a new Diffie-Hellman key exchange or half of a new Diffie-Hellman key exchange, or by ratcheting a symmetric key forward, depending on whether it's a new exchange, uh, a new ping pong, or whether it's a, a new message in the same direction. So it's possible at very low computational cost to do something that's much, much more secure than this, okay? And this is uh, an instance of where, in a sense, the cryptography being used by uh, by Threema lags well behind what modern messaging protocols do, like like Signal or, or WhatsApp, for example. Okay, I see the time is going by very fast, so let me let me just speed up a little bit. Let me show you the encrypted message format that Threema is using. So we have this key that comes in on the left hand side. That's the Diffie-Hellman shared value. It goes into this authenticated encryption scheme, and we encrypt the message type which is 01, it's a single byte, 01 for a message. We have the message content, and then we have some padding, and we actually add a random amount of padding to, to the message. And then we pass it through this authenticated encryption scheme. Um, and this is a non-space scheme, so we need a, a fresh nonce value for each encryption that we do. Now, most messengers for the nonces would use something like a counter, right? For every message that Alice sends Bob, Alice increments the counter and uses that as the new nonce value. What Threema does is chooses a random nonce for every single new message that's encrypted. The consequence of that is that, uh, oh, and by the way, the same key is used for messaging from Alice to Bob as Bob to Alice. So you might think, hang on, there must be then trivial reflection attacks against this protocol, right? I can take a message that Alice sends to Bob and I can send it back to Alice again. The only thing that prevents that is that both Alice and Bob build a database of all of the nonce values that have ever been used in communicating with them. And they check against that database whether the nonce is fresh or not. Good, I see the reaction in the room. This is crazy. This is not how you're meant to use non-space cryptography, but that's what they do. Okay, and partly that's also a consequence of having this fixed key for all time, right? You might worry about nonce, like counters overflowing or losing synchronization. So maybe the best way is to use random nonces. Um, on Android, if you ever uninstall and then reinstall the application, you can end up with the same long-term Diffie Hellman key, but your nonce database gets wiped. That means that means messages can be replayed. Okay, once you've wiped your nonce database. Okay, fine. So that's not great in terms of cryptography. There's also this metadata, and originally the metadata was sent in the clear. It wasn't uh, protected in any way. In particular, it was not integrity protected. Okay, and the metadata contains information like the time the message was sent, who's the sender and who's the receiver. Later, what they did was added a second cryptographic mechanism 
to protect metadata. Now, you need the metadata to be in the clear because um, you need to be able to deliver the messages. So the server needs to be able to see the metadata. Um, so the correct mechanism to use to protect the metadata would be, what would you use? You want it to be, don't need it to be, in fact, it cannot be encrypted because the server needs to see it, but you want it to be non-malleable. So what would you use? What symmetric encryption primitive would you use? Mac. A Mac, exactly. You should use a Mac. The problem they had was that they were using Bernstein's Macro Crypto Library, and it doesn't provide a Mac. It only provides authenticated encryption. In particular, it doesn't provide AEAD, authenticated, authenticated encryption with associated data. Okay, it only provides AEAD. So what they did was they took the EK, they put it through a KDF, and used another instance of the same encryption scheme to encrypt the metadata, put it in this thing called the metadata box. And now, the server can't manipulate the metadata box, so it's not able to you know, change the order of messages or something. Okay? The metadata is still there in the clear, but somehow the metadata box is integrity protected because it's encrypted using an AE scheme. AE gives you both integrity and confidentiality simultaneously. So this looks better, but what do you see that's wrong here from a purely kind of cryptographic perspective? Do you see anything wrong? Can you see a key separation issue? Let me explain it. The key K is used once to encrypt, and once as the basis for deriving a new key for doing a second encryption. This is a key reuse vulnerability. We did not find an attack based on this, on this, on this issue, which makes me really sad, but Morally, this is the wrong way to, to do cryptography. And this is what happens when you retrofit cryptographic mechanisms on top of existing mechanisms. They had to make a new key. They're already using the key for encryption. Or we can just derive another key from that key and then we're okay. Right? But you really should have proper key separation. You should have a root key or a master key from which you derive two keys, one for the, meta, one for the metadata and one for the authenticated encryption. Or even better, you should use AEAD. Use an authenticated encryption with associated data. The question. You want to hold the mouse here? Yeah. Perfect. Here, I guess. Ah, yeah, the nonce is used twice. Ah, excellent observation. But it's used twice with two different keys. So that's kind of okay. But if you wanted to formally analyze this, you would be in a world of pain, right? Because the keys are somehow related by an Acadia. One is derived from the other, and then the nonce is being used. So the standard security models for authenticated encryption tell you nothing about the security of this construction, okay? Now, there's one more thing I should say before I move on, which is that for backwards compatibility reasons, oh, sorry, there's a question here. How would it be like this? Because can you say that the separate process would be like the one? Yeah, so what you would do is you would have separate labels in the KDF. So the KDF doesn't just take a key as input, it also takes a a label which identifies maybe the purpose of the key or the use of the key. So you could have metadata and encryption as your two labels, for example. And then that should give you two independent uh, random strings as the output of the KDF in the two, in the two implications. So if they have just a different box, it would be with the label. Yeah, yeah, that's true, that's true. So the last point I wanted to make about the slide was that this metadata box is there, but for backwards compatibility reasons, Clients don't, clients will proceed to process the ciphertext if the metadata box is missing. So what the server can do is when it receives one of these encrypted messages from Alice, is just delete the metadata box. And then modify the metadata and Bob will accept the message because the legacy version of the protocol is still supported. So this all does nothing against the malicious server. Okay. So you get a flavor of the kinds of things that can go wrong. And that does lead to attacks. Like you can do message reordering attacks simply by manipulating the timestamps in the metadata if you're the server, in the malicious server setting. Yes. That's correct. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it has to trust Alice and Bob to create the correct metadata. But that's a reasonable assumption. We can assume that our users are honest, more or less. Okay. Okay, I want to move on and show you something much nicer, um, 
which is analyzing the client server protocol, and what did we find there? So remember, this is two, this allows Alice to communicate with the server and independently Bob to communicate with the server. How does the protocol look? So we have this key pair that we were using in the end-to-end -end protocol, and Alice will also generate an ephemeral key pair just for this session, uh, and the server will do the same. And we have the server's long-term key pair there as well, SKS, PKS, and PKS is hard-coded into the app on Alice's mobile phone. So there's no kind of PKI issues here, right? The server's long-term key is uh, pinned, essentially, in the app. Um, so then we do something to try and do authentication. What we do is we generate a session key from the short-term private key of Alice and the short-term uh, private, uh, I guess I should say, yeah, that's the short-term private key of the server. So this is like an ephemeral key. So up here, there's like a transmission of the, of the EPPS. We also make something called a vouch key, which is got by combining long-term and long-term long-term private key of Alice, long-term public key of the server to give us a Diffie-Hellman key. That's the same Diffie-Hellman we saw before, but with different keys now. And then we use kvouch and we encrypt the ephemeral public key that Alice generated to give us something called the vouch box. This is just a bit string. And then we send that vouch box from Alice to Bob and along with Alice's identity encrypted under this short-term session key. Okay, and the idea is that only Alice, knowing her long-term secret key here, could create this key. So only Alice could encrypt EPKA, right? Because you need to know the key in order to do the encryption. What's wrong with that logic? It's not so obvious, but the point is that this is replayable because Alice chooses uh, this key pair. And so if Alice maybe uh, reuses that key pair or an attacker learns ESKA, then it can just, uh, well, there's some data here that does change from session to session, but basically you can reconstruct the session key. You could recover the vouch box by decrypting and then build your own sessions and impersonate Alice, okay? So this protocol is not, immune to replay attacks in the situation where Alice's uh, short-term private key is revealed for one session. Okay, so hey, that's not really the main problem I want to talk about. The main problem is that you've actually seen now, essentially, almost a key reuse vulnerability. So let's look at this picture. On the left-hand side, we have the client to start with protocol. On the right-hand side, we have the case then. Okay, so this uses k vouch, which is uh, long-term, long-term, with the server long-term. And this uses as a message key to create this end-to-end -end message. It uses long-term, long-term, but with both public key. Okay, but these two things are not so far apart from each other. They're both using these long-term keys. And in particular, Alice's long-term secret key is, both, is used both in the client and server protocol here and in the end-to-end -end protocol here. So there's a key reuse of Alice's long-term private key across these two protocols. What could possibly go wrong? Well, let's see, okay? Let's see what could go wrong. So suppose the attacker can make, can claim the server's public key as its public key and pretend to be a user. And suppose the attacker can get Alice to send him as a user a message here which encodes a public key for which it knows the corresponding private key. Okay, so that's kind of a lot of things to ask for, but if that's the case, then uh, essentially this bit string becomes a vouch box. In other words, if you can get Alice to do the right thing in the end-to-end -end protocol, you can get Alice to send you an authentication token which you can then use to impersonate Alice in the client server protocol, and you can log in as Alice, okay? If, if you can make all of these things happen. So let's see how we can do that. So here's the structure of the message in the end-to-end -end protocol. What we want to do is find a key pair, ESK, EPK, such that the public key has this format. It needs to begin with an O1. It needs to end with an O1 because it's padded, right? We want it to be interpreted as a, a message in the end-to-end -end protocol. And we'll choose the shortest padding here. And we also want this thing in the middle to be uh, a UTF-8 valid string of length 30 bytes. 
And the reason that we want this is that the end-to-end -end protocol messages have to be UTF-8 encoded. And we want, we actually want Alice to be able to send this message to Bob so that we get the forgery that we want. Okay. So we have to create a public key of this special form, this special format. Okay. Let's see uh, how we can do that. So what we do is uh, we set in the end-to-end -end protocol, we claim the server's public key as our public key. And I'll explain how you do that a little bit later, right? That's not trivial in itself. Um, and then we ask Alice to send us this text message. So we socially engineer Alice. We say, send me this code and you'll be entered into a competition to win a car. So Alice will send Sigma to us, okay? And we can, we can actually present Sigma as a QR code that Alice can scan, for example. And um, she'll derive this key, SKA and now PKS, because that's Bob's, uh, that looks like Bob's long-term public key in the end-to-end -end protocol. And she'll create an end-to-end -end encrypted message. This one is no good, but this one is good. And the point is that the amount of padding that Alice, that Alice has is randomized, okay? And it, but it has a specific byte pattern. And with probability one over 256, we get the right length. We get the 01 at the end that we need to complete the attack. Okay, so now it turns out that this encrypted end-to-end -end encrypted message here that Paul received from Alice uh, can be used as a vouch box in the in the uh, in the client server protocol. In other words, the, the adversary can now impersonate Alice to the server. Okay, so um, the attacker can impersonate Alice to the server. Now the the attacker can log in as Alice and download Alice's messages, but these messages are end-to-end -end encrypted. So they're still encrypted under a key that the adversary doesn't know. But what the, what the adversary can now do is acknowledge certain of the messages and say, yes, I've got that message now. And now when Alice logs in, those messages will not be re-downloaded to Alice. So essentially what the attacker can do here is interfere with which, with which messages Alice receives. It can selectively block Alice's messages from being received. Okay, so this is a cross protocol attack. And this kind of attack, it arises because of the key reuse vulnerability, but it's kind of a rare attack. It's not the kind of attack we see off, very often in cryptography. They exist theoretically, but finding them practically in the wild is kind of a rare, a rare event. Okay, it's not something you see too often. So sending a single text message will compromise client authentication forever because this vouch box is replayable as well. It should be reused over and over again. How do we construct the key pair? Well, to get a public key of this format, for which we also know the private key, requires us to sample about two to the 51 keys. We couldn't think of a better way of doing it than just choosing a random private value and constructing the public value and hoping that it has this structure. We couldn't think of a better way. And my students, Matteo, who was the PhD student involved, you know, told me this is gonna cost us $180,000 on AWS to do this two to the 51 computation. Uh, I wasn't too happy about that. You can see the times 951. And then it turns out that I went on Twitter two minutes later and said, does anybody want to donate to us 8,000 cores for a week so we can do this computation? I couldn't say what it was about, but I said it was a cool research project. And actually we got some offers, uh, but not, nothing close to 8,000 uh, 8, core weeks, uh, which is like 50,000 core days. 60,000 core days. So what we did was we got smart and we, um, we used in the end only 8,100 core days. And we actually don't tell anybody at ETH, but we, we used our hacking skills to um, secure more computing resources on our cluster than we should have been able to secure. Uh, we got in ahead of the physicists and, and took some of their climate change modeling and what have you, their LHC modeling and uh, used it for something useful. Um, yeah, and so in the end, there's our public key that we're able to forge. It's not exactly principal ASCII, but it is sendable as a message in the app. And so that QR code there encodes that message. So you could put this up around the city and say, scan this message to win a car. And one in two, five, six of the people who scan would be owned. We'd be able to forge an authentication token for those people. And this works across many users, right? It's not restricted to a single user. The last part is, how do we re register the server's public key as our own public key? That doesn't seem possible. I mean, surely you have to prove knowledge of your private key at the time of registration. Well, yes and no. 
There's a special API called the Thema Gateway API, which is enabled for software developers to build apps on Thema. And there, um, you can register an account with an arbitrary public key. And at the time when we did this research, they didn't check that that public key was not the server's public key. So we actually went ahead and registered as our public key on our new account, the, um, the server public key of Thema. Um, without needing any proof of possession. It's actually a web interface and you cut and paste your public key in there. So that's interesting. Because they use the web interface, there's no interactivity. You can't do a zero knowledge proof that you know your private key, right? It's just like a web interface. So how can you even do that? You need a non-interactive zero knowledge proof of knowledge of your private key or something, but they didn't do that. We, we registered this account, uh, which stands for learning your Threema authentication something as a service. I think that's what we, that's what the shorthand for the account was. And just to prove that this is correct, here is the server key as hard coded in the Threema code. And up above, you can see the public key that we were, that we registered. This is in the app showing that it's our public key. And if you check the bytes, they, they all match each other. Okay, so we, we actually did this. Okay, so to wrap up here, I just described one attack. I gave you a flavor of other attacks against metadata boxes and so on. But actually, in total, we found seven different attacks against the Thema uh, service as a whole, one of which was actually a rediscovery and had been patched against already, which was, you know, that's how it goes sometimes. And, you know, we had varying degrees of practicality and impact of these attacks. They were not all fully practical. This one, I think, is, was actually practical. Uh, would enable you to break the authentication of the, of the, of the scheme. Um, and I'll say that... I'll maybe say a little bit more about this in a minute, but the disclosure process was a little bit tricky. Uh, and the review process with the Usenix reviewers was also a little bit tricky. They demanded that we change the paper in various ways that I considered made the paper worse. Um, but, you know, you have to play that game. Okay, so certainly don't have time to talk about Mega, so let's skip past Mega. Sorry, it's kind of fun as well. Uh, let's just go through here, okay. Okay, uh, let me just skip this slide. That's kind of fun. Okay, so can I take five more minutes? I'm past the hour already, which is way past the allocated time. Let me talk about some of the challenges that we, that we face here in doing this kind of research. It can be tricky to identify everything that's relevant. Um, you develop attacks on paper and it might not work in practice. That's why you should develop proof of concepts. It can be very complicated interacting with vendors, with the developers of these systems in various ways. Okay, so here's some issues. One is that if you find an attack against NCPA security or NCCA security, uh, that might impress other cryptographers, but it ain't going to impress a hard bitten software developer. To really convince a software developer that their system is broken, you got to show them the plain text. Right? You've got to do plain text recovery or key recovery or something impressive at that level. So just breaking indistinguishability is not usually enough to convince people that they have a problem. It should be, by now, people should understand that, like in, in, uh, in this chart here, attacks only get better over time. This is the mega sequence. We went from 512 logins needed for the attack down to six and then eventually down to two. Okay, And this was in the space of six months. So attacks only get better. Uh, so maybe in CPA does lead eventually to key recovery, but unless you can demonstrate that at the outset, people might not be convinced. I'll quickly mention the third bullet point. What do I mean by CTO versus CEO? You can have a very good positive interaction with the technical people, the CTO level people and, and his team or her team. Um, but in the end, the CEO will make the decisions about how the company reacts and what they say on their web page and what they put on their blog. And there can be a very strong difference of opinion about how to handle such situations. So a CTO will say, thank you very much for your analysis. It's great that we're working together. The community learns from this kind of research. Our app is now more secure. The CEO might say something much less positive, like why the hell are you, who is paying you to do this research? I got asked that question by a, a CEO. And I said, well, actually, you do if you pay your taxes. <laughs> it's taxpayer-funded research. He didn't like that very much. Um, anyway, uh, another issue here is that often vendors developing cryptographic systems don't have any experience of dealing with disclosures, of people coming and saying, your system is broken. 
here's how and here's what, sh what we should do. Because they just don't have the expertise. They don't even have cryptographers working for them. They're just generic software developers who are doing cryptography, which is a pretty scary thing. So quite often you end up um, having to educate them about how a disclosure process should go. So we had with Nextcloud, for example, um, they, when we told them about vulnerabilities, they just started patching them in uh, beta releases of their code that were planned to be integrated into their main releases, but were like, they were basically telling the world, oh, we have a vulnerability, but now we've patched it, but it's not yet in production, right? And like, you know, that's from a vulnerability research point of view, that's really bad practice. So we had to get on a phone call with the CTO of Nextcloud and explain to him how coordinated vulnerability disclosure should go. And then he got it and then they backed off and things went more smoothly from that point on. But be ready to spend this kind of time with people explaining to them how to do their choice. Okay, okay good. Um, yeah, I guess there's also the extra work. So you have to do the extra work of doing coordinated disclosure. But you might also decide to build a website and develop a logo and do media, try to talk to the press, and so on and so on. All of that is optional. And of course, the more of this you do, the more the scientific community accuses you of being a, a publicity hound, right? Of only being interested in the likes on Twitter. So you know, it's up to you how much of this you do. Okay, here's an example of the challenges of dealing with a company where the CTO and the CEO are not fully aligned. So this was after, uh, after we published our paper and after there was a news article about the, the, let's say the social media manager of Threema, it's a small company, said there's a new paper on Threema's old communications protocol. Apparently today's academia forces researchers and even students to hopelessly oversell their findings. Here's some real talk. And then I'll link to their, their statement on our research. Yeah, that's not quite how it went down, right? Why is it an analysis of their old protocol? Because we did responsible disclosure on their running protocol, and then they updated it, and then they tried to pretend it's only the old protocol that was affected, right? So, of course, I tweeted, uh, after a constructive engagement with Prima during responsible disclosure, this is unexpectedly dismissive. We broke their protocol six ways, we updated it thanks to our work. So of course our work applies to an old version. And that was me being very diplomatic. Other people were less diplomatic. Uh, so people said, I just deleted your app. Uh, whichever social media intern posted this should get your account privileges revoked and you may stand in a corner. It's a little bit harsh. Uh, and the last comment I really like uh, is this one from Patrick. Some of you know Patrick McCurry, massive loser. Uh, indeed, I mean, not us then, right? I hope. So you can get into these kind of like public debates that can really turn ugly unless you're very, very careful about how you talk about your research and the impact of your research, especially in the, when you're in attack mode. It's much less of an issue in proof mode when you're providing positive security guarantees about somebody's system. But when you're in attack mode, this kind of thing can happen and it's quite difficult to manage. Okay, uh, let me say something about audits very briefly. Uh, many of the systems we analyzed have been audited by cryptographic experts. But six months of a determined master's student ETH, plus a research team standing behind that, um, should be compared to a few days of work by a board auditor who's doing this for the hundredth time. In short, you get what you pay for. Um, I would say that the work that we did on Threema, for example, was probably about $200,000 worth of free consulting for Threema, uh, which is why this is kind of annoying, right? They could have played it a very different way, but okay, that was their choice. Okay, why do we do this? So now I'm really coming to the wrap up. It's fun. I hope I've conveyed a sense of the fun that we have doing this kind of thing. Uh, you might find new attack vectors that nobody else came up with before and then be able to apply them elsewhere. So when we analyzed OpenPGP, we came up with this new kind of attack called a key overwriting attack. And it turns out that is also very useful when you're analyzing mega. So you build your toolbox by doing this kind of thing. And it's fantastic for getting students into the field of cryptography. It gives you teachable moments in the classroom. And um, what do I mean by teachable moments? It gives you fantastic examples that you can use with students to motivate why you do certain things in cryptography, why the key separation principle matters, for example, really comes across from these very concrete examples. Uh, of course, this is only relevant if you teach cryptography in a particular way. 
If you teach cryptography as we go from one-way functions to pseudo-random permutations, and that's where you stop, then none of this matters, okay? So you're off the hook if that's how you teach cryptography. On the other hand, if you teach cryptography that might help your students not shoot themselves in the foot when it comes to their afterlife when they leave university, then these are quite good examples. Okay, and um, the other message, which I already explained this before, but I think it's worth repeating, is that cryptography is everywhere. Cryptography has become ubiquitous, and it's actually crucial to this, this, the security, the functioning of, of the modern digital society, right? We're all using cryptography all the time. Some of you are browsing the web as I speak, and you're probably using TLS, right? So the guy in the back who's reading his email is, you know, is using TLS. And theory is really, really important. It's absolutely necessary so that we use the right cryptographic primitives and we, we combine them in the right ways, but it's not sufficient for building secure systems, okay? It's necessary, but not sufficient. So I think that this kind of research, crypto in the wild research, is like, has this role in bridging the gap between theory and practice. It helps us understand what, what can go wrong when people take cryptography and try to use it to build systems. It also helps us identify these new use cases where developers have cryptographic needs, but they're not currently being met by the research community. And then we can feed that back into the research community and find you know, new interesting problems to work on. Um, and I think it's also interesting to understand why developers get cryptography wrong and how they, all the different ways that they get it wrong. And that might help us to develop better cryptographic libraries that address those kinds of, um, those kinds of problems, right? Maybe protect users and developers from themselves to some extent. That's a very difficult thing to do, but I think it's a worthwhile endeavor. There are lots of reasons why you should not do this. It takes extra effort beyond the usual scientific process. Disclosure can go wrong. I showed you an example of uh, adverse publicity, maybe not for us, maybe for Threema, maybe for both sides, I don't know. Um, maybe, the people who are already doing this have done all the easy ones. There's nothing left for you guys to do if you decide to, to go down this route. Maybe all the low hanging fruit has already been harvested. On the other hand, nobody has really tried doing this very much yet in the space of blockchains and cryptocurrencies. So that's like a whole frontier where I know many of you are working and are interested. I think that could be an interesting direction to go in. I also feel like writing research papers in this space, people read them and enjoy them but then they don't build on them, right? It doesn't give them a new primitive and then they extend it in some way or have a stronger security model or write the next paper. So these, these kinds of papers tend not to be very highly stated. So if you care about your H index, this kind of work's not really gonna help you very much. But we do win best paper awards, right? So people in committees really like this kind of research. So uh, is it science? Yeah, I get this question from program committees and paper reviews, you know, what can, what do we learn from this beyond the fact that that cryptography was bad? Can we generalize? Are we, is this part of the scientific process? And my argument is that if science is about the study and understanding of natural phenomena, then yes, this is science. This is understanding how this tool gets used in the real world and how we can make it better. So it might tell us something useful about how we teach cryptography or how we should teach cryptography, and also how to make cryptography available to developers in ways that encourages them to do the right thing instead of the wrong thing. This is about a API design, robust libraries and so on. Okay, and it also helps us to understand the pipeline, the CD practice pipeline, which is not actually a pipeline at all. It's like a muddy reservoir, right? With like nobody can really see to the bottom of. So, okay, fine. So um, I guess I should stop here. Let me just say, if this is interesting for you and you have ideas and you have targets in mind and you have things in the kind of blockchain cryptocurrency space, yeah, let's collaborate. I'd love to work with some of you. Thanks a lot for your attention. And I apologize for going way over time. Uh, in a really hot room on a, on a sticky Wednesday afternoon. So thanks for sticking around. Uh, I don't know if we have time for questions, sorry. In the office. Yes, yes Matteo. Go ahead. So you were doing something like that before. Uh, uh, so you're doing blocks. Yeah. So I find this. Yeah. It seems to me that one of the fundamental things, um, however, the 
behavior of certain implementations of the system and the generic automatic solvents. Yeah, yes. Uh, yes, that would be an important yeah. Absolutely not so far. And it's a great, great idea. So, so far, all I'm doing is staring at pseudocode with my students and then saying, well, this might work, right? And this is clearly not scalable and it's clearly not very efficient in terms of using my time and other people's time, all the people who work on this kind of thing. There, there are some automated tools. So uh, the guys, uh, Yurai Somorowski and the guys uh, that he works with have developed this tool called TLS Attacker which enables them to automatically kind of uh, do fuzz testing against different TLS implementations. And they can, they can try out lots of different attacks and malformed client pillows and all kinds of stuff. But that's very specific to that single, they want to extend it to other protocols like SSH or IPsec or you know, Ike or something. Um, but that's like a, a lot of effort for each protocol. You have to build new modules and new, new tests and so on. So it's not really fully automatic, but it is automated much more automated than me staring at pseudocode or my students staring at pseudocode. And so I think it's a really, really good idea, but you must remember to close the loop and actually check that the attacks do work. Like you said, it's an over approximation. And I guess also people who use things like Tamarin or other symbolic uh, tools, they will build models of the protocol and then hit a button that says, give me a proof or find me an attack trace. And then they can take the attack trace and go back and see, well, does that really work against the running system? So this is David Basin at ETH. He and his group have had a lot of success doing that for things like EMV payment protocols and uh, UMTS, 4G, 5G, uh, mobile telephone protocols. Um, so there is a, there's a certain amount of automation there, but it still involves building a hand model in Tamarind of what the code is doing. So you don't do model extraction, if you like, from, from the code. So to build a complete system that does the whole loop would be, would be amazing. And then you can just press a button and it will write the disclosure and it will write the research paper and write the proof of concept for you, right? I mean, one day, why not? That's what we should do. So I, I, think, it's, I think it's a great direction. Uh, I can't do that because I don't have the skills. Uh, I can help advise on what kinds of things should the tool be looking for uh, from the toolbox, but, but building the automated part is not my skill set. But I'd love to, love to think about that. Good. Uh, maybe there's one here, maybe. Yeah, um, okay, this one is probably the problem. Oh, but I have to maybe. Because we are shaking that this morning. Yeah. Lack of problem. For this is not our own assumption, we are already using it. Yeah. Um, so it appears to me that in case the function, you build all your work and the life that is running, that tries to hurt the person, uh, is deliberate. Okay. We want to give privacy and technology to protect their technology. Right? Mm -hmm. Or their so, intimate conversations with their yeah, but now families. For you gave yourself complicity in argument that this should, should help the company. There is a company in the show that are using Prima. Uh, uh, many of them, to my uh, humble knowledge, are diffused and have had uh, justified international. Of the international court from reaching to the heart and the virtual bonds and border. So, yeah. So, here, what makes me a bit uncomfortable is usually we make protocol against the person. It seems here, we decide to put it as whatever. How should we work? Shouldn't we reflect on this issue that maybe we, we protect the groups more than the kids? Uh, oh, I see. You know, uh, and, 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 yeah, because they lost a perfect example three, three months ago, uh, most the highest officials in, in, in our government uh, had to leave, uh, and due partially due to uh, their inability to use uh, encryption, yeah. their communication protocols were were revealed to the public, and now they are, uh, there is investigation going on that could lead to even encryption. Mm -hmm. Some of them and some of them are not left to the United States. But, uh, so we thanks to the lack of that, right, right. we possibly could make a big, big uh, step forward. Mm -hmm. How should we think about that? I, 
I appreciate the question, and I think you have raised a very difficult topic for cryptographers. And I think it's one of the reasons that many cryptographers don't engage with the real world or crypto in the wild. It's much easier and safer to stay in your, at your desk and write another theoretical paper and publish it in a, in a good, good cryptography conference and never have to worry about the social implications of what you do. And the way I square the circle that you've, that you've, uh, you've raised is that for me, it's a bit Malthusian. It's about trying to protect as many people as you can and expecting at the same time that some bad guys can, can use the system, right? So at the same time as, I don't know, Deutsche Bank, you mentioned, I don't know what they've done, um, but if you think of them as the bad guys, for every Deutsche Bank, there's a thousand protesters in Syria or uh, people who are maybe planning um, protests in Moscow, for example. And so it, I, I, I don't want to make the argument that we should be neutral and we should just develop technology and then let people use it however they like. I think that's not a very good argument. I think, I think the next level argument is to say, let's think about how does society benefit as a whole? And of course, there are negatives from making this kind of technology, secure communication, for example, available, but there are also huge positives. And for me, it's about trying to find some kind of balance between these two. Um, 